We start with an important question. What can clinicians do to improve the experience their patients have, their colleagues have, and they have? And there's undoubtedly a need to answer this question. Because on the one hand, patients and society in general come to clinicians in moments of desperation and say, take care of me. And then once that care is provided, then the same patients and society in general come back and complain about the cost, the access, the quality of care. And it's no picnic in the park for clinicians either, is they're overburdened in a whole variety of different ways. So important question to answer. Now, the key point about the answer is that we're not asking clinicians to do anything different uh, when it comes to the expression of professional discipline, but actually take exactly the same disciplines they apply to caring and treating for patients and apply it not just to patients, but to the systems of care by which care is delivered to patients. And here's what I mean. A patient walks in with a complaint, a symptom, a problem, and clinicians don't immediately jump to a solution. What they do is very carefully, very cautiously, thoughtfully, they take a patient history, do an examination, maybe run some tests, Based on the information they've pulled in through that process, they do a diagnosis trying to find some causal reason for the complaints the patient has. Based on those causal reasons, they develop a treatment plan and then apply that treatment plan and do follow-up to make sure that the reasoning connecting the examination to the diagnosis to the treatment plan, they do a follow-up to make sure that the logic is sound throughout. And then if the logic uh, doesn't hold up in practice, they repeat the cycle with even more discipline. Now when it comes to looking at the systems of care, systems of care obviously have different um, presentation of problems. It's not pain, it's not inflammation, it's not discoloration, but it could be things like hazard, it could be risk, it could be acts of omission, commission, it could be misinformation, uh, miscoordination. And, and exactly the same set of disciplines have to be applied. Um, understand the system, examine it to understand what problems are actually being presented, do a diagnosis to cause as to why those problems are occurring, then when we've got that diagnosis, treat those causes, uh, and then follow up to see if our treatments worked or not. And if they didn't, complete that loop again. Now in the case of systems, we're looking for things other than biological causes, but we still have a limited number of things that can go wrong, either in the design of the system or its operation, that give us some clue as to what we have to fix. So for example, we can be off target. We might be doing work, but in fact we're trying to meet a set of needs which aren't the needs we should be meeting. We might have the wrong person doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. And what we have to do is reconfigure the flow of work or the assignment of responsibility. Um, we might have that right, but somehow when we complete our work, the baton pass between when I finished my work and I hand my work over to you, the baton pass, the content, the form format, the time and the location by which we hand off what we've done so that someone can use that as input to their own work, there might be something broken in that. Or at the component level of work, there might be something um, misfiring in terms of how I approach the responsibilities I've been assigned. So let me give you an example or two on how this issue of targeting, responsibility, and flow, baton passes, and individual uh, work methods um, plays out. So in the case of uh, friends and colleagues at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh, the problem they were trying to deal with in intensive care was uh, central line associated bloodstream infections. And, and the numbers were staggering. Um, well, let me rephrase it. Not staggering at first because AGH, Allegheny General, AGH was fine when compared statistically to the national norms. But when they started to personalize the problem and go from the number of uh, infections per thousand line days down to the number of patients infected and the number of patients who succumbed to their infection, again, the numbers were emotionally devastating. Some 19 out of approximately 1,800 patients who had gotten lines in the baseline year had actually died due to the, as a result of those infections. So what AGH had to do is examine the process just like they would examine the patient and diagnose as to what was going wrong in their process to um, cause these infections to occur. And going through our, you know, our, our three or four levels of process concern. So the target was actually right, which is that when a patient got a central line, the key point was to make sure that there was no um, vector for infection to the patient. So they didn't have to recalibrate on the target they were trying to achieve. But they did have to make some adjustments. So for example, um, when patients were given central lines and it was determined they needed central lines during a night shift, oftentimes the staffing for the night shift was residents who were just doing rotations uh, and not on long-term stays in intensive care. 
And so they defaulted to an easier to place line, the femoral line, rather than the subclavian placement. Um, the problem was that the, it wasn't until the following morning that uh, someone more skilled, the uh, intensive uh, care specialists, uh, the fellows, um, were available to move the line from the femoral site to the subclavian site. And so the folks at Allegheny General realized that the femoral lines were much more risky than the subclavian placements. And so they had to shift responsibility and, of course, the skills associated with that. And there was some redesign of training for people doing rotations and assigned to night shift. Um, but they had to shift responsibility from the fellows in the day shift to the residents on the night shift on how to play, do subclavian placements as opposed to femoral placements. But in the interim, there were some baton passes also that had to be worked out. So while they were working up the training um, mechanisms and the time for the training and the qualifications for these residents who were rotating through ICU, um, there was all the, also the issue of if we placed a femoral line, how do we let the fellows know on the day shift that it had to be moved? And they had to go through a, a number of iterations to figure out how to tag charts, how to tag patients, how to tag beds to build the signals in, in the process that some work, had, some, some work had to be done, some action had to be taken. And then there was the, this other element of the work methods. Um, and this was in particular uh, not only redesigning how residents did their work on the night shift, but also nurses who were responsible for maintaining wound sites so they didn't have an infection. They had to do some work with the nurses, uh, redesign of the kits uh, for disinfecting wound sites, bandaging wound sites, inspecting wound sites to uh, make sure that that was intact to prevent infections from occurring. Now, net-net, as the folks at Allegheny General went through this um, series of treatments, um, maintaining the same target of perfect care, but reassigning responsibility, reassigning um, or redesigning the passing of baton, the handoffs of information from one person to the next, and the redesign of work methods, they went through these cycles again and again, just as you would in a clinical setting taking care of a patient, cycling through the workup and examination, diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up. They did that through cycle after cycle after cycle, but here's the good news. They took what was a terrible problem, 19 patients succumbing to these terrible infections on a population of about 1,800, and over the course of several months drove that number from 19 down to 3, down to 2, and then finally down to 0, and they were able to sustain 0. Now this cycle of disciplined workup and examination, diagnosis, treatment planning, implementation, and follow-up that the folks at Allegheny General applied in intensive care has worked wonders, absolute wonders in many other settings. And just as one uh, last example, example to conclude, Another hospital in the Pittsburgh region, this is uh, UPMC Shadyside, was dealing with the, the terrible problem that when patients showed up at their emergency department, it could be an hour or more before patients um, had, uh, were examined and treated. And, and the problem is, you can imagine for patients to walk into a crowded waiting room and wait for an hour, that's an overburden. Uh, for staff, there's a terrible overburden of having to navigate through such a crowded uh, working environment. There were patients who would come and actually leave and walk out the door. And, and the folks at this uh, Shadyside ED did exactly the same thing. Now, of course, their solutions were different than at Allegheny General, but the process of figuring their way, discovering their way to the right answer was exactly the same. They looked at their process and said, are we on target or off target? And they, obviously, they were on target in terms of getting people to first orders. But they had to compress very tightly the target to about 20 minutes, because 20 minutes seemed to make sense in terms of overburden on staff and overburden on patients and capacity and phys of the physical facility. They said, well, do we have the right work in the right order? And they had to do some rejiggering of who interacted with the patient and information about the patient. And then they had to figure out how to get information to move from the triage nurse to registration, from registration to the examining doctor, from the doctor who did the initial examination to people who had to then care for the patient, whether the patient was a direct admit or was held for observation. And then there were some changes made on um, how people actually completed their individual work. But long and short for the folks at um, UPMC Shadyside, they took what was an hour until first orders down to about 18 minutes. And 18 minutes meant that when someone came in, it was nearly immediate that they got care. Because three quarters of the patients who, once they got that first set of orders, could be discharged, the um, crowding and the sense of just stifling overburden in the unit disappeared. 
the patients who were held for observation were being held for observation in a much more hospitable environment. The clinicians providing care were working in a much more hospitable environment. At the end of the day, it was much better for everybody. So long and short, we start with the question, what can clinicians do to improve their experience, their colleagues' experience, and the experience of patients? And the answer is, apply exactly the same disciplines of examination, uh, diagnosis, treatment planning, implementation, and follow-up, exactly the same discipline they apply to the clinical care of patients and apply to the clinical care of the clinical processes by which we care for patients. And if they do that, and when they have done that, if they do that and when they have done that, what we end up with is much better care for many more people provided with much less overburden and much greater affordability. Good luck trying the same yourselves. Thank you.